One sec. Democracy's calling. <laughs> See you, Daddy. Bye. Hi, my name is Cooper, and this is a day in my life as a White House intern. In August 2021, the TikTok influencer Benny Drama took part in a White House PSA, which encouraged citizens of the United States to get vaccinated. You may have seen it. I imagine the logic behind this was to try and use the power of a social media star to further the political goals of the current administration, which is to increase the rate of vaccination among American citizens. Did it work? Well, there were 4 million more vaccinations in the month of August than in July. So perhaps, comment if you want me to make more of these. It is not possible to say with any certainty how much impact Benny Drama had. All the same, modern influencer-based promotion is a major part of our world. The major reach of social media and the prevalence of personal devices means we cannot escape the seemingly endless number of influencers, from podcasters to fitness gurus and educational talking heads. <coughs> but do these modern oracles of our world have any actual power? Can they persuade people to take a course of action? Well, one marketing study from 2016 found that influencer-generated marketing has as much as 11 times the return on investment as banner advertisement. Another study found that after actor-director Angelina Jolie wrote a New York Times op-ed about her decision to get a double mastectomy to reduce her risk of breast cancer, a flood of thousands of women seeking genetic screenings for breast cancer inundated clinics and hotlines in the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada for over six months. One Australian medical journal called it the Angelina Jolie effect. Okay, so influencers may be powerful in the 21st century, but what if ancient influencers helped to build our modern world? Does that sound a bit crazy? It might be, but why don't you stick around and find out? My name is Mr. Little. I want to thank you so much for joining me. I continue to hope that you and your loved ones are safe in this time of COVID-19. Please wear a mask and practice recommended distancing. So if you ask most people, they would probably say that our modern world has its roots in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. If pressed, they might point to the Agricultural Revolution, also known as the Neolithic Revolution of about 10,000 years ago. Now the story of the Neolithic Revolution is fairly well known and oft repeated beginning around 20,000 years BCE and culminating in around 9,000 years BCE, groups of humans began to domesticate plants and remain in one place to tend to these crops. But that story is not the subject of this video, nor is what came after the Neolithic Revolution. Again, a fairly well-known tale, settled farming and domesticated plants and animals provided a stable food supply. This led to population growth, which led to complexity and urbanization, which led to the rise of politics, commerce, religion, etc, etc. You get the idea. Now whether you think this was the benevolent youth of humanity, or the worst mistake we ever made, I'll leave that distinction up to you. Now this video is concerned with a gap in the story. Have a look at this timeline. Notice the gap between the first signs of human domestication of plants and animals in settled societies and the first known complex cities in Mesopotamia. The gap is about 2,000 years, and in some places it's as large as 4,000 years. Why didn't we see cities faster after farming began? Well, it probably has to do with slow population growth. But even then, this still begs for a mechanism. How did this happen? We can take clues from an idea out of anthropology known as Big man theory. What is big man theory and are there ever any big women? Actually, to answer the second question, there are some big women historically, but never as many that we know of as big men. Now the term big man essentially refers to a form of leadership and communal organization that evolves from individuals who sought influence by acquiring favors and building a base of support in a community. In an early agricultural community, this meant the distribution of food, the holding of large feasts, and the assigning of labor from within the big man's immediate circle, usually his family, to assist another group. All of this was done in the name of building a circle of influence. Modern influencers and aspiring online personalities might build a community through interacting with their followers, running charity streams, or giveaways, or doing meet and greet events. Engagement is a major part of building an audience as a modern influencer. For example, the most famous TikTok influencer, Charlie D'Amelio, built her audience in part by responding to her fans and by participating in dance challenges. Building influence is what differentiates a big man from later forms of political legitimacy, such as hereditary power or economic power. In fact, a big man might be poorer than those he helps and has influence over because he must be constantly distributing goods and doing favors. I feel like 
Charlie D'Amelio is not exactly poorer than most of her followers. I don't exactly know her net worth, but it is reported that she has 18 brand deals. According to an article published in Biological Sciences in 2015 that looked at the phenomenon of the big man, quote, in sedentary societies that lack institutions for transmitting power across generations, prestigious big men emerge and often become the center of political life. As in more mobile populations, prestige is often derived from skill, expertise, and success. But now these domains include economic production or wealth accumulation. Such societies can be found all over the world. In other words, if you've got the equivalent of money, you don't need skills. It's like the opposite of that Liam Neeson quote from the movie Taken. I can tell you I don't have money, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills. A big man might strive to have multiple wives in order for them to help him gain an influence by organizing production. A real life example from an interview conducted with a big man in Polynesia in 1920. According to the interview, quote, one woman goes to the garden. Another woman collects firewood. Another woman goes to catch fish. Another woman cooks for the husband. And the husband calls out to many people, come and eat. Anthropologists began to study big men in the early 1900s among small agricultural communities around the world. But the most well-documented research took place in the Pacific Islands and what is now Papua New Guinea. Now to be clear here, I don't wish to give the impression that efforts to learn about the past implies that one group represents a lesser or more primitive form of human organization. That idea has been used to justify terrible things, everything from scientific racism to outright genocide. What scholars are suggesting is that we can learn from groups of people who live a way of life that used to be the norm for most of humanity, but now represents a small minority. And of course, no one, no group, has been wholly untouched by our post-industrial society. But by exploring those who have made efforts to maintain their way of life, we can learn a bit more about our own deep history. I should probably also mention the term deep history refers to the study of human life and social organization and history prior to the advent of writing, so roughly 250,000 to 10,000 years BCE. As you can probably guess, there are not many written records from this time period, and so we rely on non-written sources of information, things such as studying long-term trends in human organization. And if you'd like me to do a video on deep history, please let me know in the comments section below. Anyway, how does the idea of big man theory explain the transition from early domestication of crops by humans to complex urban societies that we live in today? Well, this comes with the understanding of two fundamental shifts that took place with the transition from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture. One was that humans were no longer constantly on the move, and therefore it was possible to accumulate material goods in a way that was previously impossible. And two, that the transition to a more settled lifestyle led to a change in the system of merit and social power. How does one prove themselves in this new system which has decreased the importance of warfare and hunting? And while the scenario I'm about to describe does not apply to all places at all times, this is a general overview of what some scholars think probably went down. So imagine if you will, a small farming village, a community of perhaps a hundred people. The transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture has not eroded the egalitarian norms that previously existed, but settled society does allow for some accumulation, in particular in the form of food. Our aspiring big man, if he even does so intentionally, can utilize an advantage in this regard. Perhaps he has a larger family, which translates into a larger workforce. Perhaps he gets lucky one year and has a really large surplus of food. Or maybe he domesticates the one very particular crop that is in demand by the community. The aspiring big man can distribute these advantages as gifts or perhaps aids to struggling families. Which means the big man has now accumulated favors. And maybe when those favors are repaid, either in food or labor, the big man can take this gift and use that to gain influence with other groups in the community. Eventually Eventually, the big man might try to hold a lavish feast, competing with other aspiring big men to gain more influence. At some point, if our big man succeeds, they are recognized as the leader of the community. There are some interesting parallels with modern influencers. Specifically, modern influencers usually have niches in the market that they exploit. To build followers, they may reach out to other influencers, do collaboration work. Brand deals and product endorsements can lend legitimacy to an influencer in the eyes of their followers. On the other hand, that can also be seen as a sort of
sort of selling out. One key difference seems to be the difference on the interpersonal level. Most influencers know few, if any, of their fans. For example, it just wouldn't be possible for Charlie D'Amelio to know 17 million people. And that might have more to do with the rise of parasocial relationships in our societies since the 1950s. That is where followers of a media personality feel that they have developed a personal relationship with that media personality. Unlike later systems, the system of leadership under the big man is not an ordained or hereditary position. A big man's son will have to work just as hard as the big man to retain all that influence. As the historian Tom Standridge put it, the big man was more of a manager than a king. If the big man was only a manager, then how do we eventually reach a situation with a highly complex and stratified urban society, with major infrastructure and kings and classes of priests, such as those described in the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the earliest accounts of urban life in the city of Ur. Quote, Supreme over other kings, lordly in appearance, he is the hero, mighty net protector of his people. Raging flood, O oh wave who destroys even the walls of stone, Gilgamesh is awesome to perfection. Now, I don't know about you, but in the years that I worked in retail, I never described my manager as, quote, awesome to perfection. So one theory about how this transition might have happened has been known as the hydraulic civilizations theory. And that here means that the big man might have begun to control the source of water or irrigation for the community's food supply, and then built their power base off of that. There's also the possibility that the big man might have been able to accumulate so many favors that he was able to build sort of an informal military force that allowed him to impose his will upon the community. There's also the theory that the big man's legacy might have morphed into an early form of religion, and that this early form of religion might have coalesced around that one particular lineage and made them some of the first kings. It may have been one or some combination of all of those. So can we say that influencers a la the big man helped build the modern world? Well, sort of. It seems that the big man was a transitionary phase. The cooperation that the big man can muster tends to fall apart after a group grows beyond 100 people, unless the big man is unusually charismatic. Now that implies that the path to the complex urban civilizations we live in today, with all of their features, might lie through some sort of coercion or force unlike the reciprocity of the big man. It also seems to imply that political power might grow out of control of the food supply. It's a lot to chew on, if you'll pardon the pun. So if the big men were a transition between early settled agriculture and our complex urban societies of today, does that imply that influencers might be some sort of transitionary phase to a new form of society? I don't think so. While there are some major parallels between the big man and our modern influencers, I think the answer to that simple question is no. The modern influencer can muster many times more followers than the big man, but their actual political power is still somewhat in question. And I personally think that there are larger forces shaping our world today than social media influencers. That said, it's always interesting to look through the lens of the past when considering how our society of the present is shaped. Well, I certainly hope you found that interesting. I'm hoping this can be the first in a series of short videos that looks specifically at very ancient human history. So please stick around and stay tuned. I have a couple other ones planned in the near future. But if you enjoyed this and you want to keep learning things, why not consider subscribing to the channel? That way we can keep learning things together. You can also check me out on Twitch, and I do have a Discord channel. Links in the description below. Additionally, I've continued to post resources about the ongoing humanitarian crisis from Afghanistan. If you can give, please give. See the links in the description below. But I want to thank you so much for joining me. My name is Mr. Little, and I hope I'll see you next time.